Personalized medicine is a word that is developing a significant momentum. It's the ability to deliver either diagnostics or treatment or even care uh, around that very specific needs of that patient. And those needs are very much based on their genomic makeup, their phenotypic, in other words, the, 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 the way in which the whole physiology of the system works. Almost every disease actually has different varieties. Um, and even within a particular subclass of disease, there's a range of different responses. And that range of different responses comes from your background, your lifestyle, actually even things like the gut microbes living inside you, all the other things in your life other than your genes. Um, and so um, an important part of personalization in the future is to take that extra information beyond genetics into account, a combination of genes and in particular metabolism to help diagnose and classify people for optimized therapy. We know, for example, in certain breast cancers, uh, they have uh, a, the Herceptin treatment, uh, which was a wonderful new discovery in the treatment of breast cancer, that there's a, there's, a, there's a segment of patients with breast cancer who will benefit from that. So the ability of doing what we call molecular diagnostics and identify that receptor which, which the drug could stick to and destroy that tumor cell is one good example of personalized medicine in which many patients with breast cancer now are screened for and treated for in that way. Another example we've seen famously recently in breast cancer uh, is Angelina Jolie uh, in which we diagnosed, uh, she, she had a diagnosis or a gene called the BRCA1 gene and she had a treatment before she developed breast cancer. In her case, um, she actually took a personalized journey which involved mastectomy uh, to take that re disease risk you know, right down to zero. The benefit to the patient is that there is a more efficient treatment of their condition. So the care pathway is optimised and shortened. And if it works properly, it should cost less money than, let's call it, untargeted therapy. So there is a, a, historically a view that personalisation of healthcare is expensive. Um, well, it has an expense, but impersonalization of healthcare, which is what we mainly have now, is more expensive. So, personalization is about optimization, shortening the patient journey, and maximizing their chance of recovery. We have a number of different uh, platforms of research, one of which is to identify. Uh, certain receptors or makeup of a tumour that will help us understand whether that tumour is going to be a responder or not. We also have a lot of research in new drug discovery. We're working on a another project which is to do with um, molecular po pathology and improving that. So historically when a, a pathologist diagnoses um, a particular disease, they take a bit of tissue, a biopsy, they section it and they stain it and they have a look at it and they say, oh, it's one of those. Right? That technology, a lot of that belongs back in the 19th century. The way that we, we do things hasn't changed in some ways uh, um, for that sort of uh, problem of pathological diagnosis. So again, what we have now are laser scanners and uh, analyzing beam scanners which run over the surface of the tissue and actually create a chemical image which a computer can read. So in the future, it will be much faster and cheaper to read pathology and also um, you know, you'll be able to make potentially decisions in half an hour as opposed to seven to 10 days, uh, which um, you know, keeps the patient waiting. Uh, I work in another institution not far away from here in Imperial, which is the Institute of Cancer Research. They have probably the most famous drug discovery unit, which identifies new chemicals, new compounds, what we call biological substances, in which we can trial in a lab setting and see whether the, some of these cancers are more sensitive to these, to these treatments. Uh, we also have in surgery uh, a quite an exciting invention called the eye knife, intelligent knife, in which the smoke uh, that is generated during surgery by cutting tissue uh, could be analyzed there and then in front of the surgeon and uh, would, through a process called a spectroscopy and that will give you an idea whether, for example, we're cutting into tumours. So we're also trying to enhance the ability of a surgeon to do much more precise 
operation using INAV. We've put in advanced technologies for metabolic profiling so we can help metabolically diagnose disease much better and follow the patient through their journey to see if their metabolism is getting better or worse. So that we call that dynamic personalization where we're looking at the responses of the patient in real time effectively uh, to the intervention. What you basically have to show is that any new technology either delivers a better result, a faster result, or a cheaper result, um, or all of those things, right? So once you can demonstrate that in a clinical trial, then you, there is actually a, the, the barriers to translation become very low. So for instance, again, with the eye knife technology, we're going to be doing clinical trials next year in breast cancer and also in certain parts of brain cancer with the expectation that we'll be able to get these technologies really into the field within the next two to three years. So we have a fairly aggressive uh, translational policy here. It's very common for medical departments to collaborate with mathematicians, physicists and chemists. Within the Department of Surgery and Cancer here, we actually have 180 chemists, physicists and mathematicians within the department who work with doctors day by day so that the, 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 they get a very good understanding of the medical problems that we face and therefore can produce much better solutions than if they're working in a different building in a different sort of environment. So embedded science allows big steps in translational medicine. There's been a lot of work, including the King's Fund in population health. Uh, in other words, understanding the genetic makeup of the population, but at the same time, the disease burden, and try then to tailor, not just medicine, but care around the needs of that patient, identify those at risk, because one of the things personalized medicine will do will identify those who are susceptible to an illness before they actually develop the signs and symptoms of that illness and then intervene at a much earlier stage in preventing, for example, that uh, disease manifesting itself in the future. The future of personalized medicine is exciting because we, can, we as scientists can make a real difference to people and populations. Uh, there's nothing more wonderful for a scientist to know that his work is actually going to save somebody's life. So here at Imperial we've got a lot of scientists who are on that mission and just being part of the, the journey to improve health care is, is a privilege in its own right.